I want to give you greetings uh, from Southwest Missouri, uh, right in the middle of the U.S. I like to ask people a geography question. Missouri is surrounded by eight states more than any other in the Union. And so if I am with uh, young families, I like to test their geography and see if they can name the eight states that surround Missouri. But it's very landlocked. And uh, we a fellowship in Southeast Bible Chapel here in Springfield and uh, of course continue to travel, although these days uh, more on Zoom than on airplanes, although that is starting to change and beginning to have opportunities to, uh, to go and speak again. Uh, my wife, Anne-Marie, and I will be married 40 years this year. Uh, we have raised five children. Our children have all gone back to Europe. And so we have our oldest boy in Norway, married to a Norwegian girl, Greta, with five children. Uh, our grandkids, and then, of course, uh, the other children are all back in Ireland. So we're the only survivors left on this continent. And uh, yet, uh, about three years ago, we went back, wondering if the Lord would have us go back there, but we didn't have any peace. So we're still here. You're still inflicted with us for a bit longer. And so we're glad to be here uh, in the U.S. and serving the Lord as the, he opens doors. And I want to uh, speak to uh, the subject of the early chapters of 1 Corinthians uh, during the course of our studies. But before we really get into the early chapters, uh, what I'd like to do tonight, if you could turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 6, I want to just for an opening reading, read verses 9 through 11, and uh, want to kind of give a little bit of the background to the assembly. And so <clears throat> very familiar words to us, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Uh, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this evening. I'd like to title this message, And Such Were Some of You. And what I want to focus on is the campaign to reach Corinth before we begin to look at the epistle itself, and then the composition of the assembly. Who were the people that were in fellowship in this assembly there in Corinth? And what I want to do is to begin with, I want to give you the, the outline. And uh, the reason I do that at the beginning is because I get excited and I forget it and miss bits of it. So I want to get it out of the way. And so we want to think about the place, uh, that what this place was like, what was Corinth like uh, in AD 51 when uh, Paul visited it. Uh, I want to think about the promise, a special promise was given to the apostle concerning this city. And we want to examine that promise. And then we want to think about the preacher. I want to think about Paul. I want to think about his condition when he went into the city. What was he like at that time? And then we want to think of the power of the gospel, of the Holy Spirit, and of believing prayer, because a tremendous work was done in Corinth, and we want to examine the power that was at work there in the transforming of people uh, in this city of Corinth. And then we want to think about the people. And we're going to look at the different types of people that were in the assembly. And we're going to, just for sake of categorizing, we're going to divide them into two groups. I want to talk about the religious sinners uh, that were saved in the synagogue, and then the rotten sinners that were saved on the streets. But either way, they all needed to be saved, whether religious sinners or rotten sinners. And we want to think about the people. And then we want to think not only about their past condition, but their present position. We just read that, washed and sanctified and justified. And so that's our task this evening. So as we uh, begin, just let's think about the place of Corinth itself. And so at the time of Paul's visit in AD 51, uh, we're told, and there are various estimates, but somewhere between 100,000 and 600,000 population. And again, they vary depending on who you read, but it was uh, certainly the chief 
city of the province of Achaia, and it was a very busy city, a very commercially active city. And it was famous for lots of different things. Uh, one that was that there was a great temple uh, to, uh, to the goddess Aphrodite. And that, uh, that temple uh, was on the top of what's called the Acro Corinth, a kind of a big uh, kind of overlooking hill looking down uh, to the city. And it kind of dominated the landscape. And that temple had, uh, we're told, a thousand what they called uh, kind of a misnomer, Vestal Virgins, but they were actually temple prostitutes who would serve in the temple in the daytime, and then they would come down the hillside at night and ply their trade, uh, all in the uh, guise of religion and bringing people uh, closer to the, uh, the gods and particularly Aphrodite. It was also a place that had a lot of liquor flowing. There were 33 wine shops that have so far been excavated in the city, showing its fondness for drink as well. And part of the reason for that was it was a place that was often visited by sailors coming into port, eager to use both the prostitutes and uh, the, uh, the bars that were in the city. And it was really the main port controlling shipping between Asia and uh, the capital of the empire, Rome. And if you, if you look at your maps, you'll see that actually, uh, that really Corinth is like an isthmus. It's, it's a neck and uh, a neck of land. It's 20 miles long. And it's four to eight miles wide, four at its narrowest, eight at its, its widest. And, and so what people did, uh, and there is a reason for this, is, is that if you sailed around Greece, around the, the bottom of uh, what they call the Peloponnese, uh, there was, it was notorious for shipwrecks and difficulties, very rough waters. And so rather than do that, what people did was they came in to one side of Corinth, unloaded their goods, and then they had developed like a, a system that would carry uh, the goods to the other side of this neck, and that would go into the other side uh, of the ocean. So it would, it would work like this. It would come in the Adriatic side uh, and then go out the Aegean Sea, and they had special tracks, and you can still see the tracks today uh, where carts would be pulled with, with the, the, uh, the basic uh, luggage and stuff from the ships across, loaded onto another ship. So basically, you've got uh, ships coming in, you've got ships going out, lots of commercial activity, lots of sailors, Lots of sailors waiting until the goods are transported across the land so they can go out again. And so you can imagine what kind of place uh, Corinth was. It was also the home of the Isthmian Games. Uh, and of course, uh, not, not quite as uh, popular ultimately as the Olympic Games, but around about this time, it was actually bigger than the games in Athens. It was really a big deal to go to the Isthmian Games. And so Corinth uh, not only was known for its commercial uh, activity, but it was also known for its corruption. It was a city that was synonymous with immorality. And if I could kind of summarize, you'd, you could put it this way. It was a sex mad, sport mad, materialistic culture filled with idolatry. And it also had a very rampant uh, divorce rate and also was a litigation society. It sounds a lot like cities near you and I. It sounds a lot like modern day society in many ways. Uh, John Phillips uh, in his commentary describes it this way. He said, in the Greek or Roman world of Paul's day, casual and promiscuous sex was as common as it is today. People thought nothing of it. At Corinth, in particular, immorality was so um, <clears throat> so widely practiced uh, that the name of the city became a synonym for vice, just like Sodom became uh, uh, kind of synonymous with a particular type of sin that is still used to this day. Well, in Corinth, uh, the term to Corinthianize uh, became a way of describing somebody of debauched character. 
And so this is the city. Now, I'd like you to go with me, please, to Acts chapter 18, having uh, just this kind of description of what things were like. And by the way, sometimes we think that our problems are unique, but I think what I've described of the city of Corinth was like many cities on the North American continent today. Very little difference. And I want you to notice in, in Acts chapter 18, and you might keep a Bible ribbon there because we will be going back and forth between 1 Corinthians and Acts chapter 18, where we learn about the beginning of the work there. But I mentioned that as well as the place, we want to consider the promise. And there was a special promise given to Paul at this time. And we read it in verse 9 of chapter 18. And it says, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Now, I don't know about you, but I think this would have been very encouraging to the Apostle Paul on various levels. One, what an encouragement to press on preaching the gospel, because the Lord says, I have much people in this city, not yet saved, but the Lord in his foreknowledge knows the response, and he knows there's going to be a marvelous response in Corinth, and many will respond to Paul's preaching. So he says, I have much people in this city. And then secondly, very encouraging, the promise uh, that I am with you. Of course, Paul knew that from the Great Commission, uh, but sometimes it's good, even though we know these things, to have that assurance that the Lord is with us as we go about our mission. And then don't be afraid, speak, hold not your peace. And then he says, uh, not only that, but he, but he tells him, um, that no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. And at this stage, that would be very comforting to Paul, because prior to this, he's, he's had all kinds of uh, experiences with persecution. He's been stoned, he's been beaten, he's been thrown in prison. Uh, like everywhere he goes, it seems like there's been a riot. And, and so uh, what, what an encouragement to know that nobody's going to hurt you in this city. And so I'm sure that Paul took great heart from this promise. And again, it's good sometimes for ourselves to remind ourselves of the promises of God. And I, I, just a couple of promises that come to mind immediately is that as we go about gospel work, we still today have the promise, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then secondly, we have another promise that the Lord has given us, and that is that, that he is not willing that any should perish that he is the Lord of the harvest, that the harvest is plenteous, but the labor is a few. And so we have a lot of promises that we can bring before the Lord and be encouraged by them. So as we think now about the preacher, go back with me to 1 Corinthians, and I'd like us to look at chapter 2. And one of the things that I find interesting about Paul is that sometimes, maybe because of his writings, uh, which do seem powerful and weighty, that it's easy for us to have a wrong conception of the Apostle Paul. I think we tend to think of him as some kind of super Christian, almost like a character from the Marvel comics, you know, and he pulls back his shirt and then he's got this uh, special outfit underneath, super Christian. And nothing could be further from the truth. And so when Paul describes his condition when he went into Corinth, it's anything but uh, super confident, super Christian. Notice what it says in chapter 2, verse 1. I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then notice verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so again, just to remind ourselves, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. That's not what we normally think about when we think about the Apostle Paul, as he comes into this great city filled with immorality and all the rest of it. He says, this is what I was like. I sensed my weakness. Uh, I was fearful because, again, he's experienced much up to this point. And as well as that, 
he, he said that um, he was trembling. And so again, just a very different picture to what we normally get, not the super Christian that we tend to imagine. But then I want to think about the power, the power of God that was at work through this man in his weakness. Because he does tell us uh, in his second epistle to the Corinthians that in God's weakness, our strength is made perfect. And, and that when we're, we recognize our weakness, it makes us dependent on the Lord, and the Lord is able to use us even more fully. And so we mentioned the, the, the power, and there, there are different aspects of the power we're going to consider. The power of the gospel, the dependence upon the Spirit, and the power of believing prayer. And so uh, he talks about the fact that, um, again, in these verses, the preaching of the gospel, I determine not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And we know that he believes that this message is a powerful message. It's changed him. He believes it can change others. Uh, he talks about the fact that it was done, his preaching in verse four, my speech, my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So again, it's the, the, the depend, he's clearly dependent upon the Holy Spirit, and, and that sp Holy Spirit power is flowing through this weak vessel with the message of the gospel in a tremendous way. And then, of course, the power of believing prayer. And you might be looking at this text and saying, well, Mike, where's the prayer in this text? Because there's no mention of the word prayer, but I want to suggest to you that verse 3 would tell us that he was praying because it says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And I don't know about you, but when I feel that weak and I'm trembling and I'm filled with fear, the first thing that I do is cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, help me. Right. And so I, I really believe that this uh, prayer is implied by the fact that he acknowledges he's there in weakness, fear and much trembling. And it's also true, we know of Paul, that he didn't ever tell the audience what they wanted to hear, but what they needed to hear. Uh, we know that from his other epistles, uh, but we, we get that from the man, that he, that he told them the message they needed to hear. He wasn't very good at, as it were, uh, being politically correct or giving them a nice soothing words. Uh, he, he always gave the message that they needed to hear. First Thessalonians 2 verse 5, he says, neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, for a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. And so he would call God to, to testify that, that he wasn't a, a flatterer. He, he told it like it was. I suspect there was a bluntness about his ministry. Uh, he, he really laid it out, the man's condition, man's ruin, uh, their need of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. And so certainly he was not a smooth talker. Uh, he really confronted people with the truth. Just another uh, kind of glimpse, if we like, into the fact that he uh, was not this super Christian that we often get this impression of. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10, again, we get another little kind of window into how he was perceived. And so it says in 2 Corinthians 10, 10, he says, for his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. And so clearly this man was not uh, a kind of incredible Hulk, right? His bodily presence is weak. He's, he's already suffered uh, greatly, uh, various beatings and different things like that. So probably looked in a very weakened condition. Uh, and also, um, he speech was contemptible as far as they were concerned. He didn't use the, the rhetoric or the clever language of the day, uh, the, the wisdom of the day. And so clearly, uh, Paul was a man who was very dependent upon the Lord. Uh, he, he was not this superhero Christian that sometimes we like to believe. And so we said, well, what then was his secret? And we mentioned the power. And so we think, first of all, about the power of the gospel. And sometimes I wonder in our generation, because we were going through um, a difficult time, I think you would say 
Uh, it's not a revival time right now. And there's uh, culture is becoming more and more secular. And it's possible that we might begin to doubt the power of the gospel. And yet the gospel is powerful. And if you, if you want proof of that, all you have to do is ask yourself, what did he do in your life? Where would you be today had you not believed this life-changing message? And, and it really does transform people. Uh, it changes them dramatically. And so the only way we can explain what's happened in our own life from uh, hell-deserving sinners to transformed saints is the power of the gospel. And Paul certainly believed this and preached the gospel confident of its great power. And so I want to again just read some scriptures. You know, nothing new tonight, but sometimes it's good to review, to refresh our minds of these things. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, marvelous verses. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also uh, to the Greek. Uh, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, he, he says, uh, for the preaching of the gospel is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God, the, the dynamite of God, uh, that word dynamis, and we often make that connection with dynamite, but it certainly it can remove obstacles, it can transform landscapes and make radical changes in the inherent power that is in the gospel. I often uh, think of the power of the gospel. One of my favorite stories is the Cambridge Seven and how that came about. And of course, it began with a campaign with Dale Moody preaching at Cambridge University. And I often like to think about this. Who would you have picked to be the ambassador for Christ to Cambridge University? I suspect that we would probably have gone for a David Gooding or, or um, a John Lennox or somebody, you know, an intellectual peer of the undergraduates at Cambridge. But God put his hand on a man who was a shoe clerk from Massachusetts and took him to Cambridge. And they were horrified, by the way, at this Yankee daring to come and, and speak to the, the prize of, of England's intellect. And yet the amazing thing is that as Moody began to preach there, the power of God came upon his ministry and over a hundred undergraduates were converted to Jesus Christ through D.L. Moody. And he impacted not just Cambridge, but amongst those seven of them uh, were students uh, who gave their lives to serve in China with China Inland Mission. And they would have a profound effect on the youth of Britain but God chose to use this, uh, this shoe salesman from Massachusetts who often, people say, butchered the English language to reach the intellectual elite. And how did he do it? Well, through the power of the gospel. And it is able to change and transform. And I, I do believe that the tragedy today is that many assemblies uh, don't have a gospel meeting anymore. Uh, it's not at the forefront of our minds. We don't think about the gospel like we, we do. We've, we've, in a sense, we've abdicated gospel work to camps and to Sunday school. And it's a tragedy because we're really missing out on something. The power of the gospel is still transforming. And uh, it, it's, it's something that needs to be clear in our thinking about the place of the gospel. And then we want to think about dependence upon the Holy Spirit. He said that it was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And again, we want to think about this idea of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, we're familiar. You shall receive power after the Holy uh, Ghost has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And of course, that is reiteration of what goes before in Luke 24. And I want to just read the account in Luke 24. I find that a very interesting account, Luke 24 and verse 49, just for the, the wording of it. It says, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And that word endued, 
It's a very interesting word. It's the idea of, of somebody sinking into a garment. So imagine you, you're putting a garment on, you've got your arms raised and you sink into the garment. And so the idea is to clothe with power, to be endued with power from on high. And of course, the spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. But the amazing thing is that not long afterwards in Acts chapter four, uh, the same individuals that were present at Pentecost experienced another filling of the Holy Spirit so that they could preach the word with boldness. And so there's no question about it that if we're to be active in gospel work, we desperately need the filling and empowering of the Holy Spirit. You see this referred to over and over again in the New Testament, that along with their gospel labors, there was this, uh, this filling and this empowering by the Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, we read these words. It says, for our gospel came not to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And we need to be asking uh, that we might know something of the Spirit's power in our lives and service. The Lord Jesus said in Luke 11, verse 11 through 13, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he uh, offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And I, and I realize that we were given the Spirit at Pentecost, and every Christian is indwelt by the heavenly guest, the Holy Spirit. But it's very evident that not every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit. Not every Christian knows the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And I really believe it comes down to a lack of yieldedness to the person of the Spirit and a lack of even willingness to acknowledge the need of that power of the Spirit in our service. And then we mentioned the power of believing prayer. And I want to just get sidetracked for a moment. I've been really enjoying uh, a book about a preacher called Christmas Evans. He was the one-eyed preacher from Wales and quite a, an interesting uh, biography. But one of the things that was outstanding about this biography by Tim Shelton, published by the Evangelical Press, was his relationship to prayer. It says, uh, there, there's a kind of whole section, it's the secret of the power of Christmas Evans as a preacher and then underneath, it's got this little paragraph, a word to those who preach or pray for those who preach. And it's about prayer and prayer for preaching. So this is what these are just some of the comments. And, and I'm going to just read them briefly, but I think it might be stimulating to us. He firmly believed that all the promises of God were in Christ. Yea and amen. And he would lay hold of them with such earnestness. Well, what a challenge. Are we laying hold at our prayer meetings on the promises of God with earnestness? He'd lay hold of them with such earnestness and importunity as if it were impossible for him to be denied. And so he certainly laid hold on God and he wouldn't let, hold, let go until he obtained that which he asked. He was pleading these promises of God. He had a firm and realistic confidence that his prayers for the outpouring and influence of the Holy Spirit would be heard and answered. Here's a very interesting one. It says, he, he often would repeat the same petition several times. Once, prior to a meeting, he prayed 13 times a specific request. And the deacon who was there counting was getting ready to talk to him until after the meeting, 13 sinners had come and trusted the Lord Jesus. And the deacon did come to him, but he came and apologized and acknowledged his fault because this man laid hold of God, praying the same petition 13 times, 13 sinners were saved. He would not venture into the pulpit until he was sure that God was with him. In fact, he was convinced that there was an immediate connection 
between his devotion to prayer and the anointing that rested on his ministry. You notice the apostles, by the way, just as an aside, they said, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I want to throw out a challenge tonight. I know probably there's a number of you that preach. For years, I could say with a clear conscience that I had given myself to the ministry of the word. But if you'd ask me, hand on my heart, could I say to the same degree I had given myself to prayer and the ministry of the word, I would be embarrassed. Not that I didn't pray, but I couldn't say that I'd given the same time in the closet as I had in the study. And I wonder if my preaching would have been much more effective. I don't wonder, I know it would have been much more effective if there had been more balance between the closet and the study. And so this man, he depended entirely on God in prayer. He said, there are many men that make long prayers in public while they scarcely bend the knees in secret. Well, that's a challenge. Prayers before sermon should contain specific petitions for the aid of the spirit to preach and that the word would be blessed of God. He was fond of, this is the last thing I'm going to say on this issue, he was fond of quoting an anecdote of a predecessor of his, a man called Daniel Rowland, who was part of the Great Awakening that occurred in Wales, contemporary with Whitfield and Wesley that time. But the great Daniel Rowland, it was at an association or a conference which was held in New Chapel in Pembrokeshire, Wales. And he says there was a good deal of preaching, but everything appeared exceedingly dull. Well, isn't that amazing? Have you ever been in conferences where there's a lot of preaching, but everything seems exceedingly dull? At 10 o'clock in the forenoon of the principal day of the meeting, one of the clergymen preached before Mr. Rowland, but there was still no movement. It was still dull. And Mr. Rowland rose before he gave out a hymn or did anything else. He called to a preacher by the name of David, who was remarkable for short prayers and all was very much to the point. David, he says, engage in a short prayer before me to see if thou canst rend this thick cloud. Thou will not be longer than three or four minutes, for the long prayers that were made here at the beginning of the meeting had no effect whatsoever. And so pray short prayer, pray that the fog, the mist that's over this conference would lift. And so this is how this man prayed. Lord Jesus, for the sake of thy blood and thine agony, hear me. Thy servants have been trying to winnow here the past evening and morning. They can do nothing. Lord, there has not a single gale of heavenly wind blown yet upon this meeting. He then repeated the petition saying, wind, Lord, wind, gracious Lord, for the wind is in thy fist now as ever. Amen. After that peculiar tenderness, peculiar tenderness descended upon the congregation and much weeping followed while Mr. Rowland preached with a pleasant gale of heavenly influence. And so the power. Paul went into Corinth. In weakness, in fear, much trembling, but very dependent on divine power, depending on the power of the gospel, depending on the power of the, of the Holy Spirit, and then crying out to God in dependence on prayer. And so the people, how did this all work out? Let's go back to Acts 18, and we'll see that there was a great response beginning in the synagogue. Of course, remember, Paul always went to the Jew first, and from there he went to the Gentiles. And so it says in verse 4, it says in chapter 18 of Acts, he says, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. 
In other words, I'm pure from the blood of all men. That's the idea. It's like Ezekiel. He, his hands are clean. He's given the message faithfully there in the synagogue. And it says he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, <clears throat> one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. So they just literally moved next door. One door closed and another door opened. And the, the door that opened was the next door, right next door. And it says... And, and here's the point. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So there's a great response to the ministry in the synagogue. Uh, those Corinthians that had joined themselves to the synagogue, perhaps they were proselytes or, or, or just the proselytes at the gate, whatever that had come. Many of them were saved. The chief ruler of the synagogue, his household was saved. And, and so a great response begins in the synagogue. Look down in verse 17. It says, of course, there's another attempt uh, to shut Paul down. He's brought before the judgment seat uh, in verse 12. Of course, later on when he writes, about the judgment seat of Christ in his second epistle, they, the Bema seat, they know exactly what he's talking about because uh, the Jews brought Paul before the Bema seat here in verse 12. But it tells us in verse 17, then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue. So after Crispus is gone, now Sosthenes becomes the chief ruler of the synagogue. And it says, and they beat him before the judgment seat and Gallio cared for none of these things. And so Sosthenes gets a beating for attempting to have Paul shut down. And look now back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. And notice it says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Now, we can't be dogmatic, but it does seem rather likely that not only did the chief ruler of the synagogue get converted, but his replacement, Sosthenes, got converted through the powerful ministry of the Apostle Paul. And so the religious sinners, God was doing a work saving the religious sinners. And now we want to think about, if we want to use the term, the rotten sinners. And look at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 2, because the vast majority of the people who made up the assembly in Corinth were not from a Jewish background, but were Gentiles and they were former pagans, perhaps involved in worshiping the goddess and the temple up on the, uh, on the uh, agro Corinth. And so notice in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 2, you know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. So a great work was done amongst the Gentiles, amongst the pagans, amongst those that once were swept and carried away with idolatry. And that's where we began this evening by describing some of the people who were gloriously saved in Corinth. Chapter 6, in verse 9 through 11, he says... <clears throat> You know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither. Then he gives this, this list, a, a nasty list, really, of, of different types of sin that were being engaged in in the city of Corinth. A kind of, a, if you like, a snapshot of life in Corinth. This is what the people were like. And so he said they were, of course, fornicators. Sexual immorality, as we've already heard, was rampant in uh, with all and that word fornication is is a much broader word it, it has sexual impurity in all its widest aspects so as far as a, a person's imagination can take them uh, and so fornicators idolaters of course we know this is an idolatrous community adulterers now it, it, interesting that we often list these as sexual sins but adultery is a double whammy it's a sexual sin yes but it's also a social sin because it's utterly demoralizing and destructive to family life. When somebody has sexual relations with somebody else who is married, but not to them, uh, it's, it's really socially very devastating. 
And so we, we see that it's sexual, yes, but it's social as well. Nor adulterous, not effeminate. Now, this is a very interesting. Uh, the word effeminate, the Greek word is used uh, in Matthew 11, verse 8, when he was speaking about John the Baptist. Did you expect to see somebody wearing soft clothing? Uh, that's the, the, the word there, soft. And it, it literally sp spoke of male prostitutes of the very feminine type. Uh, and so they were they were homosexuals and they were they were kind of the feminine side of the equation of homosexuality, whereas abusers of themselves with mankind was the other side, uh, the, 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 the male uh, side of things, <clears throat> a male homosexual. And of course, this was a major problem in Roman society. And of course, is a major problem in our society too. And yet Paul went into that city and through the preaching of the gospel, uh, these individuals came to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so an amazing work was done. And so he goes on and he talks about other types of, of sins, uh, thieves, uh, of course, uh, uh, the stealing from other people, and uh, of course, uh, covetous, uh, maybe not stealing, but wanting what somebody else has got, uh, drunkards, amazing how the Bible never uses the term alcoholic, never, it always uses drunkards, because it's not saying it's a disease, because God will never send anybody to hell for a disease, it's not a disease, it's sinful behavior. It's a lack of self-control. And so uh, it tells us drunkards, revilers, uh, this is uh, people uh, who are using vile language uh, and speaking evilly of others, uh, revilers, and uh, of course, <clears throat> extortioners. Uh, and it says, these shall will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, this this horrendous list wouldn't you just love by the way to have attended the weekly testimony meeting in the assembly in corinth because he goes on and says and such as our title for our message tonight says and such were some of you and so as you would hear the testimonies of the the corinthian converts You'd have people who had been indulging in all of these various sins, who had been gloriously set free by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he says, such were some of you. And then describes three beautiful terms that would speak of their present position. They're washed. Perhaps uh, at least an inference to their baptism which is a testimony to what really happened because they were they were made clean we often sing his blood can make the foulest clean his blood availed for me and so all the filthiness of their last life their past life was washed away they are sanctified they're now set apart for god devoted to him and his service uh, this is an amazing thing. This is their new position. They, they once were, as it were, enslaved to sin, and now they're set apart to God and living their lives to glorify him in the city of Corinth. And then, of course, the beautiful words, they're justified. Justified, they're declared righteous. No longer these grossly immoral people, but declared righteous. And how did all that happen? It says, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. It was when Paul, in that weakness and trembling, came into the city and preached that gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, that they believed this message. They were transformed. They were, they were born from above. They were set apart. They were declared righteous in their whole lives and their whole eternal destiny was changed forever and so as we think about the assembly in corinth we thought about the campaign to reach corinth with the gospel and we thought a little bit about the composition of the assembly and i trust we're encouraged and our faith is emboldened 
to take up afresh the gospel banner because God is still able to do it again in our Corinthian society today. And he's still saving souls. Praise God for that. And uh, some of the young men that I'm working with right now, one of them saved 15 months, amazingly hungry for the word of God. God is still saving souls, still working in our world. Praise his name for that. The gospel still has the power to transform a life. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful for the amazing things you did in the wicked city of Corinth. And Lord, we're praying that you would do amazing things in our wicked cities today. Uh, we pray for your people that they would be energized afresh with the gospel message, that they would recognize that it is the power of God unto salvation, that it hasn't lost its power. We pray, Father, for spirit-filled preaching and for men who are prayed up before they take the platform because they recognize their need of dependence upon thee to be able to communicate thy word. And we'll give thee all the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.